Hello, Age Civil War subscribers, and welcome back to the Civil War Era in Digital Humanities. I'm your host, Chase McCarter, PhD student in history at the University of New Mexico and resource editor for Age Civil War. In this episode, I spoke with Drs. Lorian Foote and Andrew Fialka about their digital project, Fugitive Federals. Dr. Foote is the Patricia and Bookman Peters Professor in History at Texas A&M University. She is also the author of four books on the American Civil War and numerous articles and essays. Her books include The Yankee Plague, Escape Union Prisoners, and The Collapse of the Confederacy, published in 2016, which was a 2017 Choice Outstanding Academic Title, and The Gentleman in the Roughs, Manhood, Honor, and Violence in the Union Army, published in 2010, which was a finalist and honorable mention for the 2011 Lincoln Prize. Dr. Foote is also the co-editor, along with Earl J. Hess, of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of the Civil War. Dr. Andrew Fialka is an assistant professor of history at Middle Tennessee State University, where he teaches courses on the Civil War and Reconstruction, Geographic Information System for Humanists, and Digital History Projects. His research focuses on guerrilla warfare during the Civil War and spatial methodologies. Dr. Fialka is also the author of several essays and articles. His latest article entitled, Federal Eyes, How the Union Saw Kentucky Civil War, was published by Ohio Valley History in fall 2018. Dr. Fialka is also the director of the digital project of Methods and Madness, a spatial history approach to the Civil War's guerrilla violence. Their digital project, Fugitive Federals, a digital humanities investigation of escaped Union prisoners, visualizes the escape of 3,000 federal prisoners of war and reveals the intertwined collapse of the Confederacy's prison system, military defense, and society. It also exposes the location of slaves and white Southerners engaged in resistance to the Confederacy. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Alrighty, uh, Dr. Foote and Dr. Fialka, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about uh, your digital project, uh, Fugitive Federals. So I'll start us off here. Um, I'm just interested, how, does this, how did this project come together? Well, the origins of the project is I was reading um, the diary of an officer in the American Civil War, and he was captured and put in Confederate prison camps, and he ended up escaping from a camp in South Carolina, and I noticed as he was recording his diary as he escaped, he was talking about all the help he was receiving from slaves and from dissident white Southerners, and I just thought the story was fascinating, and he also kept talking about, he kept running into other escaped prisoners, and I thought, I have never heard of this. What is going on here? So it, it caused me to become curious about prison escapes in South Carolina. And I was at the National Archives, and I found that they had registers of, of federal prisoners who escaped that were put together towards the end of the 19th century. Um, I assume I, they're not dated, so I, I don't know exactly when they were put together. And there were three separate registers. Um, one of them was actually kind of misfiled. It had been put together with a list of federal prisoners of war who were killed in the Sultana explosion. So what I did was I took, I, I was very, their alphabetical list and I was just kind of fascinated by them. So I took photographs of them and, and, and I've often described this to people if you've worked with federal records in the National Archives from the 19th century. I mean, some of these manuscript books are literally the size of a kitchen table. And so at one point I was having to climb up onto a little ladder and stand over there with my digital camera to be able to try to get, you know, the entire page. So I wrote a little grant at the time I was at the University of Central Arkansas, and I wrote a little grant, and I hired the best undergraduate I had ever experienced uh, as a student, to because she was so meticulous and so thorough, as well as so bright, and I hired her to make a database of all of the names in the three registers, and also from some other letters I'd taken pictures of, and when she, when she brought in the initial database for us to check over it together, there were 3,000 names on the database. And I was floored. I had no idea there were going to be that many, even though I'd been taking the pictures. And so that really kind of launched curiosity about how did that many escape in a short period of time in this kind of one region. And, and you know, to me, it kind of indicated something wonky was going on with the Confederate prison system. And so that's kind of how it got started. And I realized, um, you know, I had been kind of seeing some 
presentations by people about something called digital humanities and the ability to <laughs> map things. And, um, and I heard about this, you know, and I, I think I saw Andrew uh, give one of those presentations. And so I was speaking at the time a lot with Steve Barry and his e-history project at the University of Georgia. And he was telling me, you know, how brilliant Andrew was and, and Andrew's uh, dissertation research that was you know, using databases and mapping to look at guerrilla warfare. And so I thought I have got to, to get Andrew on my side. And so um, after, you know, working a little bit with writing some grants and getting kind of a prototype done um, through some people at the University of Georgia, I talked to Andrew about being the co-director of the project. And because of him, we were able to then design and implement the website that we have up now. That's a very long answer to your question. Oh, no, long answers are good. Um, Dr. Fialka, could you talk just a little bit? I know uh, Dr. Foote mentioned there, but how you got involved in this project. Yeah, I think um, I was presenting on a project. I have done a lot of work with Dyer's, Frederick Dyer's compendium of the War of the Rebellion, which is three just monster volumes. This guy is, he's an incredible case study. I'm pretty sure he's got a serious case of mis- uh, uh, undiagnosed OCD. Um, <laughs> but he worked like day and night. Apparently he worked at his desk and he put a bed next to it and just would work until he fell asleep on the desk. Um, but he put together a book of a volume of regimental histories of violent engagements. And then I think like a kind of a high command officers, you know, type of volume. Um, and the university of Richmond, uh, made, uh, the digital scholarship lab up there had made a website called Visualizing Emancipation and they had mapped the regimental histories and so there's this beautiful map of all of um, the location of the Union Army and then they have emancipation events on top of that. So one of the guys who worked on that, his name was Scott Nesbitt, he took a job at Georgia while I was down there and he said I've got this code, um, let's run it on the other volume, let's run it on the violent events uh, volume. And so we did that and I was his research assistant and I spent an entire year cleaning all the data and then mapping, building a GIS um, uh, of the thing. And so that's what we were, I was presenting on. And Lauren and I had gone out to lunch that, I don't even know if you remember this, Lauren. Oh, we had gone out to lunch that day and I had shown you some of the pictures of the map and we had this amazing conversation about how like the home front is, is not even a thing. It, it, it's just totally broken down because there's so much going on and what we, typically considered to be the home front. And then during the Q&A session, this wonderful conversation broke out about how there's no home front. Uh, and Lauren and I are just kind of sitting there uh, um, making eyes at each other because we were happy that people had sort of noticed the same thing that we had. Um, so yeah, she got me on board um, and we threw a little bit of money at it and got this prototype up. And our, I mean, this is an ongoing thing. Um, we'll, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we have really only scratched the surface here. I mean, we're, we're just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, the, the project is obviously about, right, escape federal prisoners, but also as you read through the project, there's a bigger picture that's being painted here. And so uh, kind of in the introduction to the project, it talks about how kind of through these escape federal prisoners, um, you're seeing the collapse of the Confederacy, the collapse of the, the military system, the collapse of society. So I was wondering, uh, Dr. Foote, if you could just uh, talk a little bit about, you know, how exactly does looking at federal prisoners show the collapse of the Confederacy? Sure. So what happens is the Confederacy by the summer of 1864, you know, has a bunch of prisoners uh, at, at Andersonville and then a bunch of officer prisoners in Macon, Georgia. And then as Union military efforts, you know, Sherman capturing Atlanta, and then there's military efforts on the coast of South Carolina and the coast of North Carolina. Um, as these efforts are going forward militarily, the Confederacy has to, at the last minute, move <laughs> tens of thousands of prisoners out of these makeshift prison camps, and they don't have anywhere to put them. They're getting hemmed in where there's really getting to be no place they have that is safe to move these prisoners. And their, bu their bureaucratic systems are breaking down, their communication and transportation is breaking down. So what ends up happening is prisoners are moved from spot to spot with no notice. You know, 5,000 prisoners show up on a, on a train 
campaign and the commander of the city for the Confederacy is going, I didn't even know these guys were coming. I don't have any place to put them. And so they just end up turning them out into an open field without buildings and prisoners are just walking away. And so that's one level. It, it shows the hemming in um, of the Confederate military. It shows the confusion and transportation and communication. And then once these guys escape, it really, their experience moving through the, the countryside in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina really shows the extent of slave rebellion and resistance because they're encountering armed and active uh, slaves who are resisting the Confederate regime. They're encountering, you know, mass uh, regions where there are mass gangs of Confederate deserters who are ruling the mountains and women and children who are aiding all of this. So I think it shows then also the level of collapse. Um, you know, they're moving through regions where the civil governments have ceased to function, where there aren't courts meeting anymore, um, where citizens are responsible for their own security and are having to track down these escaped prisoners that are stealing their sweet potatoes and, and doing all that. The citizens are having to, to take responsibility because there's no, uh, there's no functioning security anymore in the interior parts of the interior of the Carolinas. So the journeys, too, of the prisoners reveal these different areas of collapse that are going on within um, Southern society. Dr. Fiaga, do you want to chime in there? No, I mean, the big thing with the, I'll say one thing, the, the, the cool thing with the, the map is, um, if you read Dr. Foote's book, which is a beautifully written narrative, um, it's, one of, it's, it's one of the like 1% of his you know, historical monographs that you can actually give to a family member and say, read this and they'll read it because it's well written. Um, um, you know, she kind of works in this one geographic area, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, and over in the Tennessee and sort of on the coast. And then the map is the whole Confederacy. And so the big question for, for me when I was mapping this is how widespread is the collapse? Is it just these few prison systems over here? Is it, is it everywhere? Um, and that's really the question um, that the digital humanities portion of the project allowed us um, to, to, to come up with was, look at all these different areas we could test this. How many, how many narratives of this are out there? Um, I was just I was teaching a class on, um, there's an article or a chapter that Ed Ayers wrote um, in a book called The Spatial Humanities. And he's got this idea about deep contingency that he talks about in a few different books of really understanding societies as a whole. And he says, well, you know, you can use good narratives to demonstrate this, which Lorian has done, and then Ed has done, of course, he's a good writer. Or we can try to use data visualizations. Um, and so that was that was kind of where my head was at when I was trying to visualize the collapse of the Confederacy. And we, I could do it pretty well on a couple static maps with the areas that Yankee plague covered. And then when you see the interactive map, it's kind of like, well, how many, how far out does this go? Uh, and that's what's uh, where I say we're just scratching the surfaces. We really don't know, but we have a lot more questions now. Uh, there's one particular example of a, of a party of escapees that's featured in this project. It's the Johnson party uh, who escapes from a prison near Columbia, South Carolina. It's a fascinating story. Um, I'm just curious, why did uh, the both of you choose to feature uh, this group of uh, federal prisoners? Well, when I first uh, talked to Andrew about working on this project together, I had six or seven escape parties because escape prisoners usually travel together in small groups of four to six men, two, two to six. Um, and I had, there are more than this, but I had a group, uh, a set that I had really good information, either because one of the people in the party took, kept a diary where he actually said, you know, it's December 24th and we are five miles from Saluda on this road, um, where that we could actually track key steps in their journey for the whole journey. And Hannibal Johnson, we have really good information for him because in addition to a very detailed narrative that he left where we can verify the existence 
of the places he stayed. So he'll say, I stayed on this plantation and these slaves helped me. And I can look in the slave census and identify, yep, that's a plantation. And those are the same names as the slaves that are listed on the federal census. You know, so, um, but in addition to that, um, someone from the Underground Railroad Museum in Ohio had kind of gotten the idea that you can use some of the journeys of these escaped prisoners potentially to give some information about potential routes of the Underground Railroad. And so he had requested the state archivist of South Carolina to assist him in actually kind of locating and naming particular points that are that's mentioned in Johnson's narratives and the the director of the archive shared that with me when I was doing research there so we just had a lot of really good verifiable information on Johnson's uh, route we also got lucky as far as the website is concerned uh, so I gra I graduated with a PhD in May and then I didn't start my next gig until uh, August. And so I had this summer, um, I was kind of panicking, like my wife and I were both trying to find teaching gigs. Um, and that's when Lorraine contacted me about this. And I sort of whew, um, was able to get by. So I'm working on this on this website for a couple months. And then right before the semester starts, my wife and I go to her uh, mother's house and her mother had just retired and moved to the North Carolina mountains. And I built the animation about the Johnson party escape route. And we get to uh, my mother-in-law's house and we want to go hiking and we pull out the hiking map and I see Hogback Mountain and I think no way is this the same one and I go back to the map I made and it was the same one and so my wife and I went out there totally random um, and that's where you saw the video that I took which was the actual mountain that they were on uh, which is pretty cool I just wanted to share that story <laughs> And I also, I also want to throw in real quick, uh, Chase, um, you know, I think when, when I gave a presentation on this in South Carolina, um, there was a, a professor who came up and talked to me afterwards who studies black history in South Carolina and Florida, and she thought it was very unlikely that any of the slaves um, who were guiding escaped prisoners were using underground railroad routes to get these prisoners from Columbia, South Carolina to Knoxville, Tennessee, she said, because you know most escaped uh, slaves, enslaved people in South Carolina and Georgia, they went south uh, off into Florida um, for, for, for a long period of time. So you know, I don't know whether Hannibal Johnson's route really does reflect kind of what that hope of the Underground Railroad Museum was that this might show us something about some routes that were used by escaped slaves. Um, but certainly the research they did to try to uncover that really helped us pinpoint good information for Johnson's uh, route. And this this topic, um, you know, enslaved people in South Carolina and North Carolina helping this party get to, uh, I believe it's Knoxville, correct? Um, yes. You know, as you're watching the video that starts to plot their route, you see these uh, in the descriptions, you know, in the slave cabin, hidden in the field, we were guided by this enslaved person. It kind of shocked me. Uh, I didn't, you know, it, so I guess my question is, was this a common thing for escaped federal prisoners to, to rely on enslaved people in the surrounding area to help them get to union lines or a union occupied city? Because as it shows on the map, you know, some of these guys are captured in Spotsylvania and Virginia, and they're transported all the way to Mobile, Alabama. You know, when I take a wrong turn down a street, I, I get lost and turned around and then disoriented enough. But I can't imagine the disorientation riding in a, you know, most times you're riding in a, you know, maybe a cattle car. So you're not really mm -hmm. seeing the, the landscape change around you. So I was just wondering, you know, how common was it for escaped uh, prisoners to rely on slave people in the areas and what, how else did they manage, you know, what other resources or people did they rely on to, to get to union lines and get to safety? No, that's a great question. I mean, they, they absolutely uniformly relied on um, enslaved people. And what's great is we have, in addition to diaries, the provost marshals at Hilton Head and at Knoxville interviewed prisoners who arrived within union lines, you know, when they arrived about what they saw you know, trying to get intelligence information about what was going on. And I mean, so the, the, that's kind of immediate testimony of escaped prisoners. And I mean, I, I remember one escaped prisoner, I mean, he says, 
We relied on hundreds of, of slaves and not one of them betrayed us. You know, so it's just this universal testimony that the, that the slaves shared everything with them, did everything for them. And it's very interesting too, to trace the organization that develops among slaves. Cause you know, from the slaves perspective, they're, they're um, in their cabins or they're out at work and suddenly up pops this white man that says I'm an escaped prisoner. And at first, you know, they're a little, wary but then as they realize okay this is real and these guys are escaping by the hundreds okay you know wow there's hundreds of them coming through they really develop organizations i mean they develop pickets to picket the road to watch for militia parties that might be searching for these prisoners and they develop stations that a guide will take escape prisoners to another location and then another slave will pick them up there they even have code names for the for the escape prisoners you know so there there really develops a, a level of organization and one of the thing that's one of the things that's great about telling the story of what of the cooperation also between slaves and confederate deserters who are actually cooperating with each other to defy the confederate government and um, because we're getting some of the story from escape union prisoners. I mean, these are guys who are absolutely relying for their life, as you pointed out, Chase, right? I mean, they don't know where they are. They don't know the landscape. Um, you know, they can steal some sweet potatoes, but they, they need help with food. They're unarmed. They've, a lot of them have been in prison for 18 months, so they're already kind of sick, you know, um, and anyway, so they kind of see enslaved people through a bit of a different eye than the typical Union soldier who goes marching in. Um, and so we see kind of a different perspective, you know, including one of the things that I found the most fascinating is often slaves would have a prayer meeting over the escaped prisoners before they send them on to the next station. And in a couple of cases, these prisoners, you know, they're writing in their diary what the slaves were praying. And so we get this really interesting insight into their hopes and their and their dreams and their prayers um, as they're trying to seize this moment um, to liberate themselves, to defy the Confederate government, to fight it, to do everything they can to bring down this, this regime that has enslaved them. It's also telling, we've brought this project into the classroom and, um, I can show you that when we look at the site, but I don't know that I've had a single student that's found a lot of information of a escaped prisoner who didn't rely heavily on slaves. I'm really having trouble even thinking of one and there are hundreds of uh, student biographies that have been done. So not only is it common, I mean, it's, it's almost uncommon to not yeah. find any evidence of that. Um, following the kind of the video in the project that depicts the, the route being traced, uh, you guys uh, put in a video of, of kind of like giving people a, a, a look at what the actual terrain would be like that these men were crossing. Um, I have family that uh, live in Western North Carolina, spent some winters up there, um, don't care to go there during the winter. I like going there during the summer. And, you know, that part of North Carolina, the Blue Ridge Mountains, it's, it's pretty dense and it gets uh, deathly cold, really. So I was just wondering uh, if you guys could talk just a little bit about kind of like the why you guys wanted to take that video and put that video in there kind of depicting this terrain that they would be traveling through. Uh, so, I mean, it was serendipitous how it happened, but honestly, um, so I, I did my master's at West Virginia. And there was a gig up there where <laughs> I think this is how it, it was set up. They would, West Virginia would send two students to the parks, the national park service to work as park rangers and they paid for a student and then the park paid for a student. So both sides were getting a twofer. Um, and so every, all of my friends from West Virginia all worked as seasonal rangers at the park service and right off the bat, public history was just very, very, very important to me because before I even got immersed in academia, I saw that these were two different worlds. I mean, the conversations we were having in the classroom and the conversations I was having with the public were just like 50 years apart from each other. Um, and so 
the idea of connecting with the public has always been really, really, really important to me. Um, and then, and connecting in the public in, in way, you know, trying to meet them where they are. Um, historical monographs, unless you just happen to be a hell of a writer, which very, very few of us are, um, it's not really getting the job done. Uh, and so I'm always trying to think of ways to visualize data differently. And I had watched a documentary called the Barkley Marathons, which is about this great, I mean, it, people think this guy is a sadist. Um, it's probably the hardest, like one of the hardest ultra marathon races uh, on the planet. Uh, it's in Tennessee, but it's up in the mountains. Um, and it's just this brutal environment. And it just, it just wrecks everybody that tries to run it. And I had been thinking about that and how powerful that was when I was imagining the, um, uh, the POWs in that environment, except dogs after them um, and, and militia after them. And so I really wanted to put the viewer in that environment. And I have this sort of dream of like doing it in the winter with proper camping gear and, and taking a video of myself like deteriorating over the month um, to, to really uh, let it sink in. I, I do want to make that happen. I think it would be really cool. But it, just the terrain and the water and the, and you know, I took that on my iPhone. Like I didn't even do it properly. I should have had a GoPro and done it in the winter and everything. Um, but that documentary, the Barkley Marathons can give, I think, an even, I, that's the, I actually show that when I'm teaching this, a research methods class on this of just how brutal the, the, you know, there's, there's so many things to fight the uncertainty of who you ask for help, uh, your own hunger. And then the, you stack the elements on top of that. And it's just, it makes the story that much more amazing that they succeeded. So there's a number of like really lovely uh, graphs uh, in the project that kind of give you figures, um, give you years that show the, you know, when the most escapees were, I was kind of surprised. There's such a big peak in, uh, I believe, 1864. But getting into some sources here, Dr. Foote, I know you mentioned diaries or, uh, for the Johnson party as a part of this, but what other types of sources went into building this project and kind of underscoring the data that you guys present? Right, sure. So we used, um, federal government records, there's registers of POWs to escape from Confederate prison camps. There are provost marshal records, so at Hilton Head, at Knoxville, um, for Sherman's army as well, um, that they record. Here's the number of escaped prisoners who came in today, and here's their names, and here's what we're, here's how we're disposing of them, and, and um, you know, here's interviews with them. Um, so we use those. We use local militia records, so South Carolina um, adjutant general records, North Carolina's adjutant general records, because they send little militia units or home guard units to try to kind of track down some people in certain counties. Um, we used uh, letters and diaries. I'm missing a huge source that I wanted to mention. My mind has gone blank. Um, Oh, a lot of newspaper records. There's a newspaper in South Carolina, the Edgefield Advertiser, that is particularly outraged about the number of prisoners that are escaped prisoners that are wandering through the district. So for about two months, you know, this newspaper editor just go, and that's where I got the title of the book, which is the Yankee Plague. Is is he he actually says in one of the articles, escape prisoners cover the land like the locusts of Egypt. And you know, what is the Confederate government about that it's letting this many escape prisoners and they're stealing our sweet potatoes and they're interacting with our slaves and you know. Um, so anyway, those, I mean, a variety of types of sources. That's one of the things that I think is really great about this project is how many places this story appears. Government records, newspapers, letters and diaries, um, a variety of sources. And with these sources, uh, the project is able to, especially with the interactive map, is uh, you, you guys build a number of different filters to go on this interactive map. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the different filters uh, or lenses available to users and what, you know, what, what material they present and what kind of, uh, you know, information you can take away from it? So... The, 
the way that I have done digital projects, I started doing digital projects as a graduate student when money was a real problem. Uh, you could get these little $500 or $1,000 grants, but that's not going to hire you a web developer. Uh, you need like 10 grand to start doing stuff like that. Um, so the method that I worked out with my advisor at the time, who was sort of in the same boat, was get version 1.0 quick and dirty up. Uh, do it as fast as you can. I mean, do it properly, but, you know, work with what you have. And so the, the industry standard for digital mapping software is called ArcGIS. And ArcGIS has a online version called Arc Online. Um, and that's what I use to build this. And free is not free. That's one of the biggest lessons with digital humanities is that there are, ArcGIS is this insanely powerful um, spatial analytical tool. I mean, it's sort of mind boggling how powerful it is. The free version, uh, -uh. <laughs> not getting that much stuff. Um, so what you see on this website is simply what I could do within the limitations of the free version of this software. Um, so uh, those heat maps are just sort of a concentration of points, which is cool because it, it can point us in the right direction as far as um, where else to look. And that's kind of what historians do. Uh, uh, you know, it's typically like a, a senior uh, faculty member, a senior historian sort of comes out with this groundbreaking book and then we all test it. You know, graduate students say, okay, well, is that what it looked like over here? What if we use a different method? Um, and then we sort of build a wall of historic monographs and say, yeah, we're pretty sure um, that this conclusion is correct. Um, and so all those filters um, that I've got on there are, I mean, some of that stuff I did in Excel, um, like the charts and stuff and, and put them on there um, because I was so handicapped by the, the free version of the software. Um, so it's just, you know, old school quantitative stuff um, through it and knowing how to work Excel. Um, the, heat, the heat maps are like some very basic tools in ARC that I was able to get sort of hoodwinked into the online version. Um, and then the, the points that you can sort of click on. Um, but I had to do a lot of workarounds to make the animation and a lot of workarounds to even get some of those filters up there. It's, um, it's actually frustrating for me because there's so much more that we can do, um, but it, it costs a boatload of money. Um, and then it requires a lot of teamwork. Uh, Lorian and I have met more digital humanists and geographers and people from other fields than we ever thought we would uh, because these types of projects just require you to build lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of bridges. So I think everything is just showing proof of concept right now uh, with where the project's at. Another thing I want to throw in, Chase, is that some of the, some of the parameters of what you see in the visualization is also reflective of what's in the primary sources. So in these big registers that exist in the National Archives, what these clerks recorded was the name of the person who escaped, the regiment, his regiment, um, where he was captured, where he escaped from, and where he returned to Union lines. Now, I mean, what's great is that's information that I would have wanted to map if I, if they hadn't organized it that way. But that was what was in the register. So that gave us a wonderful point. We have 3,000 names. We don't have all of that information for each of the 3,000, but for most of them, we do. So we have this wonderful, you know, set of, of names that we know a capture point, an escape point, and a return to Union Lines point. And so that became kind of a, a, a focus of how, of how we mapped things on the site. And uh, we, there was actually, so eHistory, which is where this uh, website is hosted, that's at the University of Georgia. Uh, Stephen Barry and Claudio Sant sort of got that off the ground uh, while I was down there. Um, there was, there's sort of an IT person that they have on staff who sort of helps us manage the website. And he even threw together like routes between those three sets of points, but it was just gobbledygook. It was just, you know, thousands and thousands of lines. And then none of them are accurate because when we actually mapped the Johnson party, um, you know, 
he doesn't walk as the crow flies. Um, they make mistakes, they get turned around, they have to go through swamps and all this sort of stuff. Um, and that's one of the big things that Laurie and I are trying to do now is, is model the roots of uh, the actual roots uh, where we do have information, which is very cool. Also in the interactive map, uh, the, the method that's being used, or at least one of the methods used, being used there is georectification. And so I was wondering, Dr. Fialka, if maybe you could talk a little bit about how that method is used in the interactive map. Man, I just gave a lesson on this last night, so I'm, I am just prepped for this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're co-teaching a class here. Uh, uh, it's called GIS for Humanists, um, which is something I've been trying to do uh, since I got here. Um, basically, you have a historic, we have the historic maps that the uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers built. Um, if you just, uh, they're, they're housed at the Library of Congress. It's called the Civil War Military Atlas. My copy is at home, I think, or I would show it. Um, um, but, you know, they're not, they're not totally to scale. It's actually remarkable how close they are to scale, considering they were, you know, on the ground while a war was going on. It's sort of mind-blowing. Um, but all the maps are on the Library of Congress. Um, we can, I'll tell you a link that we can post uh, for everybody. But you take the map and then you take a sort of a framework. So we also have the 1860 county lines and we know where those lines are. They were, they were surveyed by civil engineers. Uh, they're available on NHGIS, uh, which is a sort of a national historical uh, GIS shape files where you can go. So I have the, the state lines and the county lines from 1860. I know where they're at. And then I have this other map of the same space, but they don't match up. And so what I have to do is pick a point on the map that the Army Corps of Engineers, like a city, like St. Louis, and say, okay, St. Louis, I know exactly where that is on the county map. So even though it's over here and they don't match up, I need to stretch the map to make sure that St. Louis is, is exactly where I know where St. Louis is. And then I did that thousands of times <laughs> and you sort of are stretching these historical maps over a, a template a grid of the 1860 county lines that you know is legit that you know is right um, and so for this project I think I did the big national map which is what you see but when we drilled down to uh, like North Carolina and South Carolina there's 26 individual maps of the United States that the Army Corps uh, of Engineers made and I geo referenced all of those bad boys and stitched them together. Um, so that's what you see when you really drill down. And that's another thing that this can be dead useful to historians if we can find a way to turn all the features on those maps into la layers that you can analyze. So like a big thing that I did in the project where Lori and, and I met each other was compare where the violent events of the war are happening in relations to rivers and railroads. How important are railroads? Well, let's see where all the violence was. Was it around railroads or not? It's a super, it's, it's one click uh, of a button on ArcGIS. And if we had where all the roads and railroads and rivers and all that stuff was from a historically accurate base map, that could be a really, really, really powerful tool for historians. And that's another thing that Lorian and I have like scratched the surface on, uh, but we've got to write a bigger uh, grant to go do it. I think this brings up an important question, and I, and I like to ask guests this. You know, you mentioned there's um, these projects take a lot of money, and so there's there's limits uh, with what you can do. You know, as much money as you have, basically. Um, but for people interested to get starting, get started on something like this, want to create a digital project based on their research, uh, Dr. Fialco, what you know, what tools, you know, how would you recommend people get started? It, it is and it isn't. Um, you know, you can, I've, I've got a whole um, thing that I give on just like workarounds as a graduate student to do this. <laughs> um, so I'll try to summarize it on the fly here. Um, uh, for me, it was getting what I needed um, and just finding ways to do it. And I had a good advisor that had my back always. So I, know, I knew I needed to learn GIS. Well, GIS didn't count for a course requirement. 
So I needed to figure out how to make it count. So the uh, University of Georgia agreed to count my foreign language requirement as a computer language. Um, and we wrote that into the bylaws and got it changed and then taught classes on it. Um, and I know, I know a lot of the different universities do that now. Um, so one thing is just get what you need uh, and, and fighting um, to get that. You can go over to a geography department and ask for a license key. Um, to get ArcGIS. ArcGIS is ungodly expensive. It's thousands of dollars, uh, but there are student licenses available. And if you're a graduate student and you need this stuff and you can write a justification for it, you can, you can find a way to get access to the software. There are free versions, like there's a free version called QGIS. It's open source. Um, I'm a free isn't free type of, that's kind of my mindset with that. Um, but, you know, I've taken a class on GIS and I've also watched thousands of YouTube videos uh, and the YouTube videos are just as good. Um, they, they get the job done. It's more tedious. It's not as efficient. Um, but for graduate students wanting to do this, um, the, the co digital projects are inherently collaborative. Uh, you, you have to cross disciplines. You have to learn skill sets that are not being taught in your department. So the biggest thing is that you've got to be proactive in, in going out. Uh, you've got to go out and find money, but you've got to do that anyway. I mean, that's a reality for any graduate student uh, who wants to get the research done. But you've got to go over to the geography department, the geosciences department, um, and you've got to figure out how to incorporate those classes into your work and then hook up with historians that are trying to do this stuff. Um, and there is a whole pool of historians out there called digital humanists and then there's a whole pool that are historians just doing digital history which is where I fall in um, like here at MCSU we have another professor who came out of Stanford who's amazing she's a digital humanist and she knows every tool that's out there and I know one of them but I know it really really well uh, I know it really really well and so finding those people um, and just emailing them and say, you know how do I do this how do I get this done um, a big part of what Lauren and I do is in Excel and, and making a good database. I mean, that's 80% of the work. Um, so having that skill, whether you figure it out on YouTube or take a class on data, database management in the computer science office, um, you can do it all. It can, it can all be done for free. Um, you can try to force your university to give you credit for it, or you can go online, um, but it can be done and it's got to be done with the help of other people. And that's the only way you're going to get projects off the ground anyways, if you collaborate and collaborating is awesome. I, so all this Mizzou stuff that I have on is just to irk Lorian right now. Um, Cause she went it's to the working. It's so funny. You say that because <laughs> when I, first got on, I almost said something very cutting about that shirt. I didn't want to do it in front of chase. Uh, so Lorraine and I like should not be friends. They're, they're like all the things that drive people apart, like sports, religion, politics, like we just shouldn't be friends. And Lorraine's one of my best friends. Uh, and it's because of the collaboration that we've done on this project. And it's made us both better historians. It's been super fun. Um, it's made us go into weird parts of the university that we never would have gone to before. Um, so, you know, that bit of advice, like go to conferences and meet people, it kind of applies here too. Um, and it's a little weirder because we're in a pandemic and you can't meet people and you can't go to geography conferences. Um, but most of the people I know that do this type of stuff remember how hard it was. You're sort of wandering around in the dark and they've all been great about it. Um, well, I had a, a graduate student of mine email, Will Thomas at Nebraska, um, who did this amazing railroad network and that guy is crazy busy and he got back right away and just said yeah that was really hard here's what I can offer you um so email me uh that would be my how to get started yeah I was wondering uh Dr. Foote if you can maybe talk about because um there's specific examples of using this in an undergraduate course in a in a graduate course as well so I was wondering if you could just talk about you know how you've incorporated fugitive federals into the classroom. And then just generally, uh, I'm interested in, in both of your um, thoughts on, uh, you know, using digital humanities, not only as a, as a teaching tool, but a research tool um, 
right now in the middle of this pandemic? Actually, this project is is something that I think, uh, and I'm hoping to find out in the spring will will translate really well to the to a pandemic learning environment um, because you could do so much online with it. But um, anyway, so I at Texas A&M we have a required sophomore history research methods class, and what I have done uh, for the past two semesters is have the students in that research methods class write biographies of prisoners, escape prisoners from the database. And, and I've developed a series of assignments that helps guide them through acquiring skills that you need to do historical research. So they go through the website, kind of study it. I have an assignment that asks them questions about the website. Then they read my book, Yankee Plague. And as part of that project, they learn how to, what is an argument? What is that the argument of each chapter of the book? What are main ideas in the book? Um, then they read a historiographic piece by Gary Gallagher about Confederate nationalism and the Confederacy. And they see that there's debates about how unified was the Confederacy? How much dissent was there? And I ask them to say, okay, where would you put Yankee plague in this debate? Um, do, and, and they have to learn to identify the argument of a historiographic essay. Then I have them read an analytical um, article on Andersonville prison and they have to learn to identify what's the argument here. Then we get into teaching primary source research skills. And so I have them read some diaries and some government documents and we talk about how to do a deep reading and a reading between the lines of primary source documents. And we talk about how you find documents and what's especially great about teaching research methods with the Fugitive Federals website is that, I mean, these are 3,000 men of whom only a handful are really famous. Most of them were incredibly obscure individuals um, that it's really hard actually to find information about them. And so the students are really challenged to try to find something. They can't just look up, you know, look, look something up in your kind of typical sources and they really have to dig. But because by this point in the class, one, they're sucked into the story and think it's really interesting, but two, they know that what they're going to write is going to be part of a digital project. They're, at least in my experience, they're very motivated and very excited. And so um, they work really hard uh, to try to find things. And then they write these biographies that we post on the website. And I just can't tell you the feedback. In fact, um, just yesterday, I was Zooming with a student from my seminar um, in the fall, uh, fall or spring, I can't remember which, of 2019, he was asking me to write letters of recommendation for him. And he said, Dr. Foote, I still remember everything I wrote in those papers for you. That's the, my favorite thing I've ever written. And, you know, I, I, I don't think he was just sucking up because he wanted me to write a letter of recommendation. I think he really was speaking from the heart. Um, and, I, you know, I've had, I've had a student, uh, you know, email me recently, hey, I was just looking at the site and I saw my biography up there, you know, who I hadn't talked to in two years and here the student was looking at the site again. So um, it's just a wonderful teaching tool because it teaches them research methods and you can do kind of a smaller version of it in just, you know, a 19th century uh, US South or even a Civil War class where you just have students kind of research one of the people and just give them some general instructions. So there's different ways you can incorporate uh, research for students using the site. And, you know, Andrew and I are happy to share, I'm happy to share my syllabus and all of my assignments with any faculty member um, or instructor who wants to use the site with their students. Um, and we've had actually uh, students do research on this project from four different universities, Texas A&M, University of Georgia, Middle Tennessee State, and Texas A&M Galveston. Yeah, and I mean, I've experienced the same thing and I've taught this as an assignment in a Civil War class of upper level undergrads. I've taught this as the uh, research methods class for upper level um, history majors. And then I've, I taught a, um, what was a graduate class? Like 19th century readings or something. And they, they either had to write a typical research paper or I said, all right, here's all the digital products that I work on. If you wanna go after this, that's totally fine too. And 
um, that freedom with this project was so cool because I had a couple, uh, I had one student that said, I don't like ARC. I'm going to use this other mapping thing. I think it can do it way better. And I thought, whoa, all right, bring it on. Um, and that stuff is invaluable because there's so many digital tools out there that knowing which one is the right one is half of the battle. Um, I did my entire master's thesis on the wrong tool uh, for a year and then had to scramble and redo the whole thing in ARC. Um, and that's just a lesson that everyone who does something like this has to learn. Um, so when I took it to the graduate students, they were really able to move beyond learning research methods and then and move into using digital tools as research methods. Um, and now that we're offering this class, GIS for Humanists here, uh, all those students that have GIS skills are basically able to take what we're the things that we did in this project and they use that as an example and they can go and do it in their dissertation. So I've got a student who's mapping all of the uh, telegraph wires during the civil war uh, to see. That is awesome. Yeah. It's so cool. Um, and he learned arc in an unbelievably short amount of time. Um, just insane student. Um, really, really good. Um, but he's very interested in sort of, P political arguments and how quickly they traveled over the wires to influence like elections and all sorts of stuff. Um, so the, like my favorite thing about teaching this is you're teaching skills. Um, you know, you're not just teaching stuff in the class and typically, you know, we teach a lot of writing skills and critical thinking skills and all this type of stuff. It's just one more skill that you can layer over the top. And right now in this job market, which is cutthroat and brutal, um, if you've got digital humanity skills, it's a foot up. Um, you know, just, just look at the job postings page, uh, and and you, it's very clear that this this can give you an edge. Uh, so that, to me, is a way that we can give back and try to help some people get some jobs. Okay, um, so this is the site. I'll walk through this, uh, Lauren. If you'll just input wherever you want. Um, this is what's called a story map. So again, ArcGIS Online is free, um, but you got to work in their template. Um, and this is one of their sort of templates as a story map where you can tell a story and sort of embed images um, and a little bit of um, uh, functionality in there. So these first couple sections, um, I'm basically trying to rehash uh, the Yankee plague and Lorian's argument, um, just in case, you know, a lot of our students, um, they'll look at this before they go, go read the book. Um, or if it's like in a, a civil war class and I have an assigned Yankee plague, they can still get the gist of everything. So the text is sort of my summary, uh, or I can't, I don't even know who wrote these. It's a summary. It. Did I? Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> um, it's a summary of, of the book. And then I tried to visualize it. Um, so this is a static map that I built in ARC, but this, this is where soldiers were, uh, uh, POWs were supposed to go. Uh, they were supposed to move out of Georgia and go to these other prisons in South Carolina and North Carolina. And then uh, Sherman had taken Atlanta and then the Union Army was sort of coming in on the coast as well. Um, and I was also able to share these. These are great. Uh, Lorian, I'm assuming you found these. Yes, yes. I, I had a graduate student who researched uh, historic maps for me as part of the project, and she had collected hundreds of maps, and so that's one of the ones that she had found. Yeah, these are, these are amazing. Um, and these weren't able to print in the book. I don't know if that was a, you know, something with UNC or what, but we were able to share them here, which is really, really cool. Um, um, I love looking at old stuff like this. Um, so the first one is the proposed movement. And then this is a static map of what actually happened. <laughs> um, so once the prisoners uh, were sort of moved to these uh, makeshift prisons, a lot of them escaped uh, off the railroad uh, cars. Uh, and then a lot of them, like some of these were just fields with no, you know, no fences or structures or anything. And so they bailed um, Augusta, I think Sherman, uh, was uh, 
Um, it was rumored that Sherman, that some of the some of the escape prisoners thought, like the Confederacy thought, that Sherman was headed for Augusta. He actually wasn't. But once they got to Augusta and realized he wasn't there, they trailed his army towards right. the uh, Hilton Head, New Bern, obviously, and then uh, a lot um, over the Blue Ridge Mountains to Knoxville, uh, which once you get up in those mountains, is just crazy. For any of you who have hiked the Appalachian Trail, which is through here, um, uh, it, it's pretty, to think of doing it with no shoes on is, is kind of wild. So that's what the static map is. And then we get into where I was sort of trying to flex some uh, DH muscles here. Um, so this is just points. And, and as Lorian said, we had three distinct locations where POWs were captured, where they escaped from, and then um, if they made it, uh, where they uh, went back to Union lines. So that was pretty easy to just map, make three different maps of just those points, uh, which is what these three are. Let's see if the second one takes as long to load. Cool. Um, and you can see the black line is the 1860 county line. That was sort of my framework. And then I had to stretch uh, geo-reference the, uh, the map that the, Union, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers made over the top of it. And I also had to do uh, some tricks, like there was 100 points in the same spot. Well, that wasn't going to work. So I had to write a little bit. It's called the jitter mod in Excel to sort of make a cluster of points. Um, but we learned a lot just looking at, you know, this is where Lorian's book is concerned. And there's so much stuff in other places. And so I'll get a student who's from, you know, Louisiana, and they're like, oh, well, I'm going to do I'm working on all these over here, um, which is really cool. Um, um, that happens a lot. Um, these are the heat maps. Um, I, it's just a tool. Uh, you can sort of display density. Uh, you can visualize the data a different way. Um, so instead of looking at all those dots, which is a little overwhelming, uh, you know, this is where most people are captured. Pretty obvious. Um, in Virginia, um, and then where we would expect sort of Chattanooga all the way down to Atlanta. But there's all these other hotspots that, um, you know, need to be investigated to see if Lorian's conclusions hold up in these other places or, or what's happening locally on the ground, if things are different or the same. Um, these are just in Excel. This is just super old school quantitative stuff. Um, um, when, once you have a good database, this is kind of one of the biggest lessons of DAH. Once you have a good database, there's a thousand tools out there that you can just sort of plug your stuff into and go. But if your data is messed up, it's an absolute nightmare and it's not going to work. Uh, so, I mean, a vast majority of what I do is my students working on this stuff is cleaning up their databases and building them the right way so that they're very, very flexible and you can just plug and go on a bunch of different types of uh, digital tools. Whoops. Um, oh, this is awesome. Okay, so this is, um, this is where we publish undergraduate and graduate work, um, which uh, like Lorian was saying, um, you know, it's hard to get excited about a project when you turn it into a professor and then never see it again. Uh, and you just delete it off your computer. Um, I think my students were really motivated and I built it up. I was like, you know, be better than those students at UGA, uh, you know, take it to them, show them <laughs> you, you got crushed in football this year. So let's, let's beat them with nerds. Um, uh, so I sort of played out the competition and it, it really did work. And we, um, let's see here. Every semester we sort of update all of their work um, and put it all here. These are just the, the like base undergrads that are incorporated as one assignment into a class but there are hundreds of these. This is 350 pages long. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and then we've got them, you know, listing all their sources so that a graduate, like what I, what my graduate students do is say, oh, well, this undergrad must have not done a good job. I'm going to follow up on this name and they'll find out a lot more or something. Um, so this, what you see here is the lesson plan that we had incorporated into one class. But, you know, we've since Lorraine's designed a whole research methods class. Um, and I've sort of designed 
ways to introduce this on the graduate level. Um, but everything's published. It's something that you could put in a, you know, use as a writing sample and say that it's on a website, which is really, really cool. Um, oh, and I should say that um, so some of these dots, when you click on, you know, it lists the information that we have. And um, if we do have uh, biographical information, I think maybe we don't have that up there. I'm not sure. So that, yeah, that's part of what we're trying to do with, okay. we're trying to write a grant to do a whole bunch more stuff with this. And that's one of the things that we want to do is link the biographies with the dots. These sections don't talk to each other. Again, limitations of uh, free isn't free. Um, but there's a million uh, things to do here. This is just an animation I, I made. Um, and I think it's really cool because, um, you know, if you see a straight line, it really doesn't mean anything. But when you go through and look at what he wrote in his diary and, and the actual ground that he traveled, um, it's just more eye opening. And then you add this to it and you really get a sense of what the heck was going on. This is the video that I actually took um, um, of the landscape. I did it in June. Like my dog and my wife are in there. Uh, we have, you know, we're not being chased by dogs and we have hiking boots on and stuff. Um, but same mountain. Uh, they tread the same ground. And this was a brutal, it was a pretty hard hike. I mean, I was sort of, I had to grab tree roots and pull myself up the sides of hills because it was so steep. Uh, and the dog is just sort of scrambling the whole time. Um, um, and then one thing that digital humanities is um, getting better at is, is crediting. Uh, especially undergraduate work and um, graduate student labor. Uh, um, this is a really huge issue. Um, and it's personal for me too. I, I, and I think some, a lot of graduate students who get research assistantships and do lots and lots of work um, might feel a little hosed um, by how they're credited. Um, so one of the cool things with these projects is, is trying to think of, um, innovative ways to get people credit and, and show the work that they did. Um, UCLA has sort of a, a bill of rights uh, for credit for DH projects. And we tried to adhere, or we did adhere um, to all of the things that they've outlined. Uh, that's sort of the gold standard for crediting students. Um, because this is a new field, it's a, little, it's a little wonky and some of that labor can fly under the radar and we wanted to make sure none of that happened. Um, so all of our students who have, you know, information uh, or all the people that we worked with, uh, we've got all their stuff linked here. Um, we made it very clear um, what it is they did. Alrighty. Well, Dr. Fiocca, Dr. Foote, thank you so much for um, uh, taking some time today to talk with Age Civil War about uh, a really fascinating uh, digital humanities project in Puget Federals. Um, if you'd like to explore this project more, there'll be a link uh, with this video. Uh, and also, uh, you can find a, a link to this project in this video under the resource tab on the H Civil War page under Digital Humanities. Uh, and before I let the both of you go, um, where can people find you on the web and see what you're up to? Lorian? Yeah, I'm available. Uh, I have my uh, history department professor page at Texas A&M University's history department. Um, and then also you can email me. My email address is available on my web page. Yeah, for being a digital humanist, I actually do not use social media. Um, so <laughs> I'm not on there. You can't find me on there. Or if you can, I haven't checked it in years. Um, <laughs> So I've also got a, a, my page at MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University. I've got a personal website, andrewfialka.com. Um, that kind of shows, I, I build, I sort of do freelance GIS maps um, for grad students and um, academics. So if you need a map, uh, I'm happy to work with you um, and do that for you. Um, and then ehistory.org that's where Fugitive Federals is hosted. Um, and there's a lot of really cool projects there too. Um, uh, I've got my dissertation project is, is there as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it. All righty. Well, thanks again so much for joining us and thank you everybody for watching.